how your tax is being reduced. Actually, it automatically, automatically shows me the tax I have to pay. Hmm? Without reducing my business capital, it also helps me not mix my business money with the money I get from the garden. Aha. Do you know that this book is showing me that you haven't paid me the carton of soda I advanced you last hey, month? Mugasha. You also remember that? Yes! This book helps me to remember every detail about this show. Huh? Mugasha. Guy, you know things and you don't even tell me. You didn't ask. Eh? Try it. You'll thank me later. <laughs> Let me first deal with the customer. But. Wiri, don't forget to pay the URA tax in time. <laughs> I won't, I will not. Okay. Good morning, Uganda. Good morning, our viewers. It has been a good morning to most of us, and uh, thank you very much for tuning in. We are here once again with the tax mutuzi from Uganda Revenue Authority, courtesy of the URA studio, and uh, we are going to discuss uh, pertinent issues. Today we have a blend of uh, some of our visitors out there have come to join us in our tax mutuzis. So you will see different faces that are not actually URA, but they are stakeholders in one or the other trying to promote the businesses on which we hope to collect taxes from. My name once again is Hafsa Seguya from the Tax Literacy Unit. Uh, my work is basically to walk through the client in business, see their compliance is the best, and see how best we can deliver a mission by mobilizing revenue at the end of it to lead the country to economic independence. Uh, I have um, uh, two ladies with me here. I think they can do self-introduction since uh, they are visitors. They will know what exactly they need to tell you so that we can know them well. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, Hafsa. Thank you, Hillary, for having us. My name is Nora Kondi-Ngare, and I'm the director of the Deal Flow Facility at Financial Sector Depending Uganda. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Brenda Moni is my name and I'm a portfolio relationship manager with the deal flow facility. Thank you very much. I think you've had um, the introductions. They're all from the deal flow facility. They are here to dissect what you will understand. Or you need to understand with the deal flow facility. It could uh, sound a fancy name, but we want them to localize it because uh, as uh, we had already told them, our clients here, we, uh, we make sure that we simplify what we tell them, so that they can uh, basically gain out of this uh, tax mutuality. So over to you, um, Nora. I think you will you will do some uh, talking about uh, the deal flow. Then uh, over to your colleague before we can move on. Thank you, Hafsa. So the deal flow facility, what it is in essence is a technical assistance and matchmaking facility for SMEs in Uganda. And I'll break this down further. So what has historically happened is that SMEs in Uganda have had challenges in raising capital, specifically non-bank capital. And so what the deal flow facility does is that it comes in to help businesses raise capital. Now how we do this is that we work with businesses that meet some criteria, the three specific criteria that I will discuss um, shortly. We work with them to understand their business in and out and more specifically identify the gaps in their businesses that are a challenge to them raising capital. Then we help them address these challenges through technical assistance and once the businesses have gone through this technical assistance, we then match them with a pool of investors that we have. Now what we do in the matching process specifically is that we match in businesses with what we deem to be the best fit investor for them. Now just taking a few steps back, the deal flow facility was set up in 2021 and it was the brainchild of financial sector deepening Uganda in concert with the Capital Markets Authority of Uganda and it is funded by the European Union. 
So it is a five-year program and we are currently coming to the end of year one where we plan to work with at least 400 enterprises to get them investor ready and match them with investors before the end of the five years. So the, what we look for in businesses is three key criteria. One, we are looking for businesses that are registered and operating in Uganda. Two, we are looking for businesses that have been in operation for at least two years and have audited statements for these two years. And three, we are looking for businesses that are raising at least $500,000. And this is the equivalent in Uganda shillings of about $1.8 Now, this amount that they're raising can be either debt, it can be equity, or it can be a combination of the same, of, of these two elements. So in this sense, we are instrument agnostic. So we are able to work with businesses that are raising either equity or debt. We are also sector agnostic, and what this means is that we are able to work with businesses across all sectors in the Ugandan economy. So the deal flow facility opened for applications on 25th of January. Now the applications are open on a rolling basis, and we take on businesses as and when they are ready to apply. We take them through various elements of technical assistance, from the basics of capital raising in Uganda context, all the way to more technical elements addressing specific challenges that businesses encounter. For instance, we help them assess and fix issues around corporate governance, around risk, around financial management, to name a few. Now, one of the elements that the deal flow facility really focuses on is on education and increasing awareness of what businesses need to do to succeed. And one of the key elements that we find that is critical for businesses is tax and the understanding thereof, which is really the purpose of the session today, to work through issues around tax, specifically the taxes that apply to businesses and how they can ensure that they're in tax compliance. Back to you, Hafsa. Uh, thank you very much. I don't know whether um, uh, Brenda has something to add on. Uh, no. That, yeah. not really. Yes. Uh, our viewers, as you've heard from uh, Nora, she has given us um, an, an insight of uh, the deal flow facility. It is basically, maybe uh, I would say to the viewers, it's like um, you're looking for financial assistance. And normally what we are used to is going to a bank, going to a microfinance. But here we have the deal flow. Deal flow tells you I don't need say, uh, collateral. Deal flow tells you I don't need processing fees. Then, then maybe what you need to do is to make your company available. And how available is it? Make sure we start with the registration. Because uh, here back in URA, what we are looking at is w the first thing we look at when you're starting business is to formalize. Because we might have a lot of businesses out there, but the formalization itself. As you've heard from Nora, they are not going to match you to an investor when you're still a briefcase company somewhere, when you are nowhere, you're working undercover. So the in thing is formalize. Formalize uh, is very clear because you are able to make it even simple. Simple how? We are collaborating with other government agencies like um, KCCA, Uganda Registration Services Bureau, and the uh, Ministry of um, Local Government in the municipal councils. The reason why we do this collaboration is to create one-stop centers for our clients. Mm. You need to formalize, you need to register this uh, business name, you need to register for taxes. We want you to get all the services at a one-stop. That is why my collaboration comes in. And uh, my viewers out there, in case you need to work with deal flow, automatically these are the baby steps you have to start with. Mm -hmm. Make sure you formalize this business. Mm -hmm. Give it that name that you wish to. Then uh, it Im is that implies that you need to go to uh, Uganda Registration Services Bureau, still at the one store, to register the business name, to register the company name. If it's a company, automatically you need to register it. You need to incorporate it because you incorporate it once in its lifetime. Then as you get whatever papers you have, that is what your RA needs to ensure that it will register you for taxes. And when I talk about registration for taxes, that implies that I am simply giving you a tin, and my tin is free. That is the, the that is uh, the best news I would like to tell our clients. Provided you go to the one-stop shops, these services are free, so you have started the journey to do business. But if you start the journey to do business, I want records. 
Because as you've heard Nora say, they need records. How will you come up with the audited uh, books uh, for the last two years when you don't have any record on yourself? And what constitutes your records are these simple, simple things. Your invoices, your receipts, and all that. Those are my business records. On a day-to-day, -day, what I do, what I push out, what comes in eh, in terms of income and the expenses there and probably your purchases, depending on what business you do. So all this put together is when this auditor will manage to come up with the audited books. Mm. Then once you are ready, you have registered, you have formalized, you have the audited books, then that is when you'll have a conversation with Nora's team. That is how it comes because Nora's team is basically telling you, look here, you are doing business, but you would need support financially. You have tried the bank, probably it has, it has frustrated you. You have tried the bank, it may have been expensive, because some funds are there, but they're expensive in the long run, as you keep on paying back. When you sit down to analyze what you've paid back, maybe in about four years or five years, eh, you couldn't imagine that your bank has paid it back. Mm. And at the end of the day, when you look at the um, profits in your business, probably they did not even make up to the interest that you paid back. Mm. So that is when deal flow comes in to see that it can make these facilities or these funds cheaper by matching you to invest an investor that will probably look at your portfolio and see how best they can help you uh, further business. Because with Uganda Revenue Authority, what we are interested in is to see that this business that starts does not close. Because I am looking at widening my tax base. How am I widening it? By expanding the register. And when I bring you on the register, I am making sure I nurture you the right way. Yes, I will tell you about taxes, but you will need funds. I do not want you to get funds that are expensive because at the end of the day, if you don't have profits, ideally I don't have taxes. So it works in such a way, I want you to do business that is gainful on your side and ultimately you'll push taxes to us. So that is the picture we are trying to paint to our listeners out there to know why URA is seated with deal flow, is partnering with deal flow to see what deal flow has for that client. And when that client gets the funds, where is the obligation they have to meet? Because ideally now you've gotten a team. Yes, you have gotten a team. Deal flow has matched you to an investor. You've gotten those funds to either push the business further or do whatever you need to do but in business. But I am looking at you waiting for the year to end and the obligations when you register. Because as I give you this team that is free, it comes with rights and it comes with obligations. And among its obligations is one, keep business records. Two, file your return. I'm talking about now the income tax return because when I give you my team, income tax by default has to be there because you're starting this business with an aim of getting income and when you have that income provided it's a, it is it surpasses 10 million then that is when my income tax comes in because I'm taxing this income that has come through and when I'm talking about 10 million 10 million is my threshold for income tax in the event that your business doesn't make 10 million that ideally indicates that you are going to give me that return, the return to paint that picture, but there won't be any payment. But in the event that you exceed 10 million, I am looking at the excess of 10 million, that is where my income tax comes in. So ideally, even deal flow would like to deal with a client who is compliant, implying that they can easily get you, you have a fixed place of abode, they can, they can follow up here and there, because uh, they don't want you to, they don't want to match you with an investor, then tomorrow you get lost. So that is why we go through the nitty gritties to ensure that actually you are a person that they can check on every now and then to see how you're operating, to see what exactly happens. Is business moving on? Is everything okay? Did you get the funds? How well did they help you? What assistance do you need? Because the reason why we do the financial literacy is to ensure that beyond the taxes, the business is moving all the way. It is like having a cow and you want to milk it. 
But before milking it, how well have you prepared it to produce this milk that you are going to come and milk, maybe at the end of the day? So that is where we actually come in to expound on certain issues like this. Because when I'm looking at a, a business, fine, I've given you my tin with income tax. Income tax is uh, uh, the tax that I am taxing on your income. But ideally, as she mentioned, at least you should be able to get, is it 500000 dollars Exactly. Mm -hmm. So its equivalent is about 1.6. So that indicates that ideally you surpassed the VAT threshold. Because our threshold for VAT is 150 million. Once you can make the 150 million as your gross, not profits, in a year, it implies that you register for VAT. Mm -hmm. So that also comes in eh, to see that on top of the income tax, the VAT has been registered for. So when I am looking at the entity, if this entity is, say, a manufacturing entity, then uh, the local excise duty will come in. Because ideally what you are producing is produced locally within the country. That is how the local excise duty comes in. When I'm also considering the item that you are pushing out, is it excisable? So those are some of the taxes that we expect you to be registered for. Then I will also look at pairs you earn because it's difficult to have an entity like this and you work alone. Ideally, that implies that you employ. And uh, when you employ uh, different persons to work for you or to work with you in your entity, then it implies that you will be paying them a salary on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. But when I'm talking about payers, you earn, it has a threshold. That is 235000 So in the event that you pay this person or this staff in excess of 235000 that is when my payers you earn will come in. Implying that the income of that staff is eligible to tax. And the tax it's eligible to will be payers you earn. But it is not that staff that is going to register for payers you earn. It is you, the withholding agent. You, this company that has come up and registered, that has gotten assistance from Dale Flow but you are definitely you have to be uh, compliant you have to oblige with your obligations that implies that we look at the different tax types that come in handy if you're to operate comfortably and you are in good books with uganda revenue authority so that means that before paying your 5 10 20 staff you need to withhold a small portion from their salary then push it to uganda revenue authority and these returns are expected on a monthly basis. Monthly basis implies that you also pay your salary on a monthly basis. So as you pay the salary, you have withheld. So we give you a month to do all this. Then when the month ends, the first 15 days of the following month, that will imply that you push in the pairs you earn return and tell us, look here, Uganda Revenue Authority, these are my staff. The ones I have in my entity, my company, my factory, whatever it is. And this is how much I pay each. And this is what I have deducted from them because it's called pay as you earn. The more you earn, the more you pay. Okay. The lesser you earn, the lesser you pay because we have different brackets of pay as you earn. Ideally, even now uh, withholding, withholding tax is very clear. It's clear in such a way that um, you may find that you are designating you as a withholding agent. Implying that you have, um, you have companies or entities that could probably could be supplying you if you are a manufacturing entity or otherwise. That means that when they supply you and they are supplying you in excess of a million, if this supply is a million and above, it means you need to withhold 6%. Ask me why we do it at that point, because that is the taxing point. That is the point when I have discovered this business. So you, the entity that registered, that got well assistance from deal flow, you are doing very well good. 
we have designated you to withhold. Ideally, failure to withhold will imply that you will pay the component that you didn't withhold. So let us be very keen as we are doing business here and there when I am supplying you, say the contract amount or the sum of uh, the transaction is about maybe 10 million, but you need the items in piecemeal. That means I'm looking at the total value of that contract sum. So ideally that will be, we need to withhold from that particular entity in the bits that it is delivering because the whole sum contract is more than a million and uh, it's eligible to be withheld from the withholding tax. So ideally I wanted to look at um, the different tax types that may come in handy in case you're in business. Mm. Because look here, you will get the facility from deal flow and you're done. But when you're done at the end of it all, you may come to a side here and probably you either relax or you don't know what is supposed to be done. At the end of the day, you may find uh, penalties eating away your, your profits. Because uh, with Uganda Revenue Authority, as you fail to comply in some instances, the penalties come in handy to ensure that they put you in the right shape. Just give, to give you an example, say you're registered for VAT, and this return reaches us after the 15th date of the following month. Irrespective of the nature of return, whether it's a new return, whether it's a payment return, whether it's an offset return, we are, the system is, in fact, the system is automatic. I don't even need to be there at midnight or one minute past midnight. The system will just post 200,000 in your ledger. You'll find it there the following day, then you ensure that you make it good. But ask yourself that 200,000 is coming from what? It's going to come from your profits. Basically because you did not do what you have to do at the right time. So that's the reason we are here trying to see that we make both ends balance. As you're trying to secure the facility, ensure that on the other hand, with the taxes, we are good to go. You are in the right shape. You're in the right picture. So that nobody takes you off hand. Because even income tax in itself, you may say yes, my business can uh, maybe push out about maybe 200 million a year or so, whatever it is, as in your turnover. But when you look at expenses, the expenses may surpass that. Most of our businesses that have just started, that is where we get issues because there are a lot of costs here and there. You're not yet stable, you're trying to stabilize in the industry, you haven't gotten the gymnastics of that industry, so we expect that. So that is why I go back to my record keeping. What will inform you of uh, that very uh, scenario? Because you need to keep records. So that when you're preparing these uh, audited accounts, they will clearly show you, yes, this came out of your income, but this also came out of your business expense or your purchases. And ideally for that year, when you're filing my return this end, it will be an, an offset return or a carry it forward. You have a credit balance, so we just tell you carry forward to the next financial year. Then we'll see what will happen when the year starts. So I am trying to paint a picture to somebody who wants to understand how does deal flow come in. Yes, it comes in on the other hand, because when we start businesses, we want them to expand. Nobody starts a business that has to be static. It is only being unfortunate that it becomes static. But why should it be static when deal flow is here? Because a business is all about uh, thinking and seeing what to do best. Just be smart. Try it. See whether it fits your requirements. See ideally whether it will work for you. You have been looking for funds and probably you didn't know how to get them. They have a simpler option. I think we need to try them and see whether actually it fits into the equation of our businesses mm -hmm. to see that the businesses are better. Because we are looking at businesses graduating. Ideally, when I'm collecting this year, the target for this year can't be the target for next year. Because I imagine these businesses are progressing from uh, small to medium, then to large. So that is where we are looking at our businesses trying to progress so that is why we come in on site facilities 
to see that we walk this journey together with you because I will need the taxes at the end of the year. But what have I put into place? I don't want you to go for financial assistance that is damn expensive. Then that means you're not in business because you won't be able to break even. We have costs that can't go out of business. Operating costs that have to be there. It's a given. You have rent, you have expenses, you have a trading license, you have other licenses, you have salary, you have other business costs that you have to input to be able to get a particular product that you're producing. So ideally that is where we want to center our discussion today and see how best we can understand each other, we can add value onto the listener. Mm -hmm. Because there's a listener out there who is listening to us. Mm -hmm. But I want by the end of this to have added value onto you and you say, where can I, where can I find deal flow? Let me try to give, start a conversation with them. How best can I fit in? We have financial analysts that uh, work for different entities. I think this is a food of thought eh? for you to see how you can get in touch with um, the facility owners to see how best you can further that business. Thank you very much. I think, uh, Brenda, you have something to add on? Yes, thank mm -hmm. you so much, um, Hafsa, for that uh, presentation. Uh, maybe just to recap from your discussion, uh, since our theme today is understanding business taxes, I've picked up a couple of taxes. Uh, income tax, right? Value added tax, excise duty, withholding tax, and payee. So are these the only five uh, taxes that that these growth stage companies that we are targeting have to pay or there are any other beyond that? <coughs> what happens uh, with taxes? Yes, I mentioned a few, but these taxes are also progressive, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. When I have just registered this business, by default, I have to register the income tax onto that team. Okay. But I wait for you to see how you are growing in turnover. Mm -hmm. Then my VAT comes into play. Then I am waiting for you, one, to see, are you a manufacturer? What are you manufacturing? Is it excisable? Then the local excise duty comes in. So then I wait for you to see how many people are you employing and how much are you paying them? Then the pay as you earn come. Because most of the people register these companies mm. and ideally they are directors, one, two, or three. They are trying to try off this or that or that or that. They will tell you, no, we are, at the moment we have just started, we are not paying ourselves salary because uh, we are trying to understand the gymnastics. So I cannot tell you register for pay as you earn mm -hmm. when there is no person employed. Mm -hmm. And ideally you, the directors, are not even paying yourself mm -hmm. because you're trying to see how you can stabilize in the market mm -hmm. and probably bring uh, staff on board to see how best you can kick off. Mm -hmm. So they are progressive in nature because it is what you do and how you do it, mm -hmm. how your turnover is demonstrated mm -hmm. that will prompt me to register you for another, another tax type. type. Mm -hmm. But those are some of the tax types that I would expect to register for because uh, this is a combination of uh, direct and indirect taxes, taxes that I would wish to collect. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are a collects a number of taxes. We even collect non-tax revenues and other non-tax revenues. But ideally they are not in the picture now because they are pretty off. Mm, we have, because non-tax revenue, I'll have things like stamp duty, mm. I'll have things like a driver's license fees mm. and motor vehicle. Maybe motor vehicle fees would come in handy in the event that this entity has uh, assets, assets, like yeah. motor vehicles. Mm. That is when these fees will come in handy. And maybe stamp duty will basically come in if, um, because we have a number of instruments. You could have an increase in share capital, in the company, so we we'll increase share capital. Ideally, stamp duty comes in as an appreciation of the shares. Then you could sell off some shares. Yeah. Definitely, that uh, disposing mm -hmm. of shares calls for stamp duty. So, as I had told you, it depends on what has happened eh, in your entity to call for a particular tax type. We do not bring all of them and give them to you at once. Mm -hmm. But we keep on monitoring you and seeing what is happening here. How are you progressing? Then the other comes in. Because ideally when I register all these on the onset, you may suffocate. Mm. Because you're trying to get a direction of your business. And here I am with about five or six tax types. 
and they all have different obligations, mm -hmm. at the end of the day you will choke. Mm -hmm. So that is not how we do in URA. We try to take it slowly by slowly, slowly by slowly. When you're mastering the income tax, then that is when I say, let me bring in the VAT, VAT. because you have grown mm -hmm. and your threshold, your, your, your turnover is way big, mm -hmm. you qualify. Mm -hmm. Then if you start the manufacturing, I will come in with the local excise duty. So I take you bit by bit mm -hmm. so that you can try to fit in and try to see how you can accommodate these other obligations that come in. Mm. Mm. Uh, Any yes, thank you Hafsa for that in-depth presentation. I have a couple of questions that would be very specific to enterprises that are raising investments. The first one is around withholding tax. So you've mentioned that there's withholding tax that is payable. So I'll give an ex a specific example of an investor who has made a loan to a company here in Uganda. Let's say the investor is a foreign investor that is not domiciled in Uganda and has extended a loan for argument's sake where the interest is, say, 10 million Uganda shillings. So is there withholding tax applicable on this interest? And if so, who then pays, who withholds this tax and who remits it to URA? Uh, thank you very much. When we look at withholding, we are well aware that uh, we have transactions that may it include uh, players who are not resident in the country, but still uh, we need to withhold at that particular time. So I am looking at this entity, the, the entity that has uh, benefited mm -hmm. from this transaction from the investor. So at the end of the day, when you are paying back the interest, you will need you yourself. Let me imagine I am the resident company this mm -hmm. side. I've gotten the facility from the investor. I need to remain with the six, the fifteen percent, mm. with myself here. I just imagine I have withheld it from myself, because it's not fair to tell this investor who is not resident here that please apply for a team, mm -hmm. please withhold, because now with withholding tax, you mm. cannot uh, submit a return when you don't have a team. Mm. It is mm. very clear. Mm. So I tell you, just imagine you've withheld from yourself. Mm -hmm ensure that you get a payment registration slip via a portal, then pay the 15%. Mm. Because the 15% that you have paid ideally is a final tax to the other investor, just because the investor is not present here. Mm. And uh, secondly, maybe what we need to note in this particular transaction, as you make payment, you, the company, they have given the assistance, that is resident here, ensure that you file because you can file a withholding re tax return even though you're not registered for withholding tax. You just, you just indicate that this transaction involves a non-resident. Then you can file because you will have paid. You know when you pay in a system, mm -hmm. the system is looking for a corresponding transaction that led to a payment. And that should be the return detail. So please return and indicate that transaction because it has to close that up with the payment you did. Mm -hmm. So then we rest it there. Okay. Exactly. And because now if this um, investor called investor mm -hmm. was resident here, then ideally the, the investor okay. would have okay. been registered and would have done their work. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. That has actually answered the next question. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. going to ask yeah. if the investor is resident, then yeah. they would be expected exactly. to be exactly. called. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, so then my next question is around capital gains tax. Mm. So if we're looking at a specific example where an investor has made an equity investment in a local Ugandan enterprise, and at the point where they want to exit, maybe there's a sale of shares where the Ugandan enterprise actually makes a gain in capital. Mm. What is the law on capital gains tax? What is the percentage? At what point is it um, with, at, at what point is it paid? Uh, capital gains tax is very clear. Whenever uh, there is a gain, definitely on uh, capital, as you've given an example here, it's equity, and uh, you've sold shares. When you sell shares, definitely, I should imagine you sell them at the time they are appreciating. Mm -hmm. Definitely there is a profit of some sort or whatever it is. It is 30%. It is very clear as and when that happens. Okay. Because you will not say you will sell shares maybe once. Mm -hmm. 
mm. as and when because you float them on the market when you feel it's uh, it's juicy for that particular time mm. you will get people who will buy them mm. so when there is appreciation of these shares in one or the other mm -hmm. the ones you've sold so that profit that you will make it's just 30 percent of it okay yes. so 30 percent of the profit itself uh, when you sell when you sell exactly not a paper profit uh -huh, it has sell. to actually be realized. It has to be realized. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm not going to wait for you to write your books and say, you know, this is a profit. Uh, mm. Yes. Okay. So that is in the case of a Ugandan business, for instance, who has sold shares, an investor has come in and they've made a profit and then they pay this capital gains yes. tax. Let's take it from the other side where it's an investor who had bought shares in a Ugandan enterprise yes. and now wants to exit and sells these shares to someone else. Yes. But this investor is not Ugandan domicile. Are not they Uganda. subject to capital gains tax? Yes, it's subject because the transaction has happened in Uganda. Okay. And the entity in which the shares are being sold is in Uganda. Mm -hmm. So whatever happens, even though you're not resident, whoever is there, because we even have companies here that register, mm -hmm. and you will find uh, most of the, all the directors are not resident. Mm -hmm. So normally we tell them we need, we want you to give uh, powers of attorney mm -hmm. to whoever will be available for us. Mm -hmm. Either it's your lawyer, it's your accountant, somebody should be able to run the business, the company, while you're not resident here. So that's the same person who is answerable to seeing that that has to happen in real time. Okay, mm -hmm. completely understood. Mm -hmm. Because registration, definitely we have, um, we have different businesses here and there and uh, it's, I think it's all about uh, I think creating awareness mm -hmm. because uh, some clients do certain things when they don't know that actually they are taxable. Mm -hmm. They'll say, ah, for me I had shares and somebody came here, I sold them, Nambi Mala, Nambi Vamo. Not knowing that what you did at that particular time was attracting Attracting. tax, mm -hmm. but you did not do it the right way. Mm -hmm. Because ideally when you're selling shares, uh, that means you are selling them to somebody else, or you're bringing in somebody else in the company. When you go to a sister company, Uganda Registration Services Bureau, they will need to show them a certificate Correct. of those shares that you sold. And as I told you, shares is an instrument mm -hmm. when it comes to stamp duty. So they will need details so that they can, they can rhyme with the records. When you started, how much share capital did you mention you had when you registered in the entity? Mm -hmm. And how much do you have here? So, a discrepancy in all that, they need details because ideally, some companies may not even know that after registration you need to file returns with the Uganda Registration Services Bureau. The essence of filing a return is one, to know that the company is still alive. Mm -hmm. Two, we need an update on such things. Mm -hmm. Have the directors changed? They haven't. Yes, three, is the share capital still the same? Mm -hmm. Is there an increment in share capital? A decline in share capital? That is where the gist of the matter yeah, is. Yeah. So as you register with the Uganda Registration Services Bureau mm -hmm. that there is a, an increase or a decrease in share capital, ideally that is what you are needs to see. Mm -hmm. In these audited accounts you talked about, mm -hmm. that is where those nitty gritties are felt for me to come and say, hey, look here, but there was a sale of shares. Mm. How come I didn't see the capital gains here? Mm, correct. Exactly. Mm, correct. And you mentioned about filing returns. So yeah. let's give an example where an enterprise is registered. Let's say they registered in 2020. Yes. The beginning of the year. Yes. And have not necessarily started operations fully to yes. the point where they are actually generating revenue and mm. only start, say, in 2022. Mm. Do they, are they expected to file new returns for those two years where they're not operating or can they just start filing returns at the point where they start operating? Uh, thank you very much, Nora. What happens with, um, let me start with, because when you register a company, as I had said, you start with the Uganda Registration Services Bureau. Mm -hmm. When you start with it to register this company name, it will give you a certificate of incorporation and company form 20, what was company form 7. Ideally, they expect a report on annual basis, and this is this return. Mm -hmm. Whether you've worked or you haven't worked, they expect something. Okay. Then Uganda Revenue Authority comes after that, gives you a tin, implying that here we are registering you for 
taxes. Mm. Here you just said the business name or the company name, whatever it is. When I register you for taxes, I will say, yes, I'm giving you tin this with these tax types. Say income tax, mm -hmm. I will say it's effective uh, maybe 1st of January, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, 2020. When I say it's effective 1st of January 2020, what you need to understand with the taxes is we look at you in the uh, financial year aspect. And my financial year runs from the 1st of July to the 30th of June. June. Implying that when you came on board on the 1st of January, 2020 mm. that implies that i have six months mm. to end the year mm -hmm. on the 30th of june, june. 2020 mm -hmm. so i will expect you to paint a picture mm. of six months by the 30th of june okay. and tell me what has happened however good or bad mm. that is what i need to mm. know because ideally it's not that whoever files a return makes a payment. Mm. But I want to paint a picture for me to understand you better. How is the business moving? First of all, are you still there? How is it moving? Mm. Okay, then let's wait for another year. Mm. You file this return. In most cases, it may be nil. Mm. Or if it is not nil, it will have more of expenses here. Because ideally, you haven't yet generated income. Mm. That means that whatever expenses are there, you will carry forward mm -hmm. to the following year. Mm -hmm. So I am, I am meant to, I am meant to graduate you like that. Up to your 2020, where you're going to start generating income, mm -hmm. and this balance carried forward in business expenses will come in handy mm -hmm. that I will reduce by whatever income will be there. Then I will arrive at my chargeable income that I am going to charge to tax. Mm. So ideally, these issues of taxation wouldn't have been complex. But it is just understanding them and maybe getting interested. Mm. Because one will say, Nzisakola, atensasura, chisakola. Forgetting that my teen has rights and obligations. You have an obligation to tell me what has happened mm. through your return. Then I will not that wait for the following year. Yeah. That is exactly what deal flow will want. This compliant client. Exactly. You may even say, I you know, we need a tax clearance to see that actually you're moving on well in terms of taxes. We want you are to paint for us a picture. How are you moving on with them so that we can know that the person we are dealing with is an upright person or company? So that is where we come in with the compliance bit. Mm. The filing for income tax is twice a year. Mid-year, I expect a provisional return. Mm. When my year starts on the 1st of July, by 30th of, uh, 31st of December, I expect a provisional return. To tell me in the first six months or 12 months, what do you anticipate? Mm -hmm. But this provisional is not static. You can keep on amending it after 31st of December. Those six months, you can keep on amending, 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 because definitely business is coming in here, there, mm -hmm. here, there, keep on amending. So that when I come to 30th June, mm -hmm. by midnight, I know whatever you've told me, the provision is final. Mm -hmm. Then here I will request you that please push in your final return. Final implies that now you're telling me the actuals, mm -hmm. because the year has ended, whatever has happened has happened, you are certain of it, it is what you should paint a picture on. And ideally, when I come to 30th June midnight, I give you another six months. Mm. And I tell you, look here, if the final return is now due, I'm giving you six months to wrap up. Let your auditor, let your accountant try to put everything together and send this final return. Mm -hmm. It's the return that wraps up the year. And through, it's through these returns that you will be able to do the audited accounts mm -hmm. and probably the management accounts that will inform the owners of the business the direction in which it's moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question is on tax compliance because like you rightly mentioned, as a deal flow facility, 
one of our requirements in terms of documentation is a tax compliance certificate. So two questions. One, what are the requirements for a company to obtain a tax compliance certificate? And secondly, how does the tax compliance certificate capture self-reported taxes like capital gains, for instance? Um, thank you very much, Nora. When I'm um, definitely issuing a tax clearance certificate, it is basically, as you hear the word, it's clearing you against your compliance to taxes. But when I am giving it to you, automatically you registered for tax types that are very clear. You may be having the income tax, the VAT, mm -hmm. uh, the payers, you earn and all that. So we do a check across all the tax types to see one, how is your registration? Is it proper? Are the, directors, are, are the directors updated on your registration profile? Are there contacts there? Then two, I look at the filing. Yes, you could be good at filing for the company, but are the directors filing? Mm -hmm. Then three, are you paying what you're filing? Or if you're not paying the, all that you're filing, do you have a payment arrangement made with us? to see, to tell us when you will be clearing this and that. Mm -hmm. So the check that we go through here may not actually be represented in, in figures on the tax clearance certificate, but at least once we push out the tax clearance certificate, mm -hmm. as the word indicates, that means we are comfortable with your behavior in terms of taxes on our register. Mm -hmm. That is very clear because we push out everything has to be looked at and addressed including your capital gains and everything. Mm -hmm. Because some of these taxes at times uh, may not be uh, addressed in depth at this time, but at times we, 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 do, we do advisories, advisory visits to our clients, we do audits, and that is when at times we may dig deep mm -hmm. to get these facts and uh, they are incorporated in the audit. Mm -hmm. As we conclude an audit, we make sure everything mm -hmm. has been catered for so that we know we've audited the, these three years up to maybe 31st December 2021, mm -hmm. and that is complete. So we don't expect anybody going backwards, we expect moving forward. So that mm -hmm. is how we do our work. But once we push out the tax clearance certificate, automatically it will indicate that you are not bad, you, you, you're fairly well mm -hmm. with compliance in terms of tax. Taxes. And what is the application process? How does a business go about obtaining this tax clearance certificate? The tax clearance certificate, the application is online because with URA we try to leverage more on data, mm -hmm. on, on, on technology, technology, sorry. Yeah. Most of our applications are online applications. Implying that even though you're seated at home, feel free because we are trying to reduce on the interface. And most so when COVID came, it was even worse. But just, it, just because it found us with uh, those already applications in place. Mm. So what we do is we just tell you to just ensure that you have done the filing, have done the payment, and all that is well. It's just a click. Just log on via portal, visit the portal page on www.ura.go.ug. Once you reach the portal page, you're going to log into your account. You, re you look at the portal page on the right-hand side, in the corner, you'll get the login button. Click on it, you'll put your login ID, that's the TIN, and your password. Mm -hmm. Once you're there, you'll have entered into your account. And when you enter into your account, that is when you're going to tell us what do you need mm -hmm. from URA. So you're going to look at where the tax clearance certificate is. Mm -hmm. So when you click there, then we'll ask you, want it for what duration, which financial year. What is the purpose? Mm -hmm. Because we have purposes that we put there. Are you going to tender? Are you going to mm -hmm. move ma money? Are you going to do what? So in the event that uh, it is not mentioned there, we have a provision of others where you can clearly say maybe I am applying for a financial uh, facility uh, with the maybe deal flow and it's a requirement mm -hmm. for them to probably process what I need then you submit to us, it's just a one page document. Then you submit, then we look at it. Then as we respond to you, in the event that deal flow is registered because their tin has to be there. Mm -hmm. 
So when we respond to you, whatever I respond to you, equally will go to Delflow. Mm. You do not need to print them, take to them. If it's an approval, as you get a notification, Delflow has to get. That is why we ask you, where is it going? Mm. So that you give us the tin of that entity, mm. where it is going. So that on your tin, mm -hmm. ideally I should imagine there's an email. Yeah. And that is where you're going to get the alert from. Okay. So that you know that actually this has been passed by you or eh? then you can further your discussion with this client. Mm. Yes. That's very good because it ensures the authenticity of the certificate. Exactly, because yeah. in the olden days what we used to do, it was just a paper, you you put in your request, bring it to us, we mm. could stamp, write our comments and take. But what we discovered in between giving you this certificate and it's reaching probably deal flow if it's the one that needs it. Mm -hmm. There are many things that have been altered mm -hmm. there. So at times they are not representative of what we wanted to say. Mm -hmm. So we said maybe we need to put the process online. Okay. And secondly, it even helps uh, our applicants. You could be applying for this facility and it's the deadline. Just imagine I approve it at 5 o'clock. It's difficult if it was a paper, yes. mm. then pick it, you'll mm. find deal flow has closed, then that's the deadline. True. But ideally, as I approve, if it's uh, if it's the last day, I think a day ends uh, before midnight, then automatically deal flow will find it in their mailbox. Mm. So basically, that is uh, what part of what we are trying to do on the service management on the other side, seeing how best... We can serve these clients in real time mm -hmm. so that they do not miss out on certain opportunities out there. Because uh, when you look at a tax clearance, it is basically uh, meant to further business or to see how you can enhance business. That is basically why we need to take a decision at the earliest to see whether we are accepting or not accepting. But in most cases, we want to make sure that this client gives this facility because once I, once I do not help you probably get this facility or this job or whatever it is, eh, or this tender, mm -hmm. then I am not building for myself where I'm going to get the tax mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Because I want you to go and do business. I want you to get this money and plow it back in business. So that when I come for taxes, at least I expect mm -hmm. a particular portion that is mm -hmm. reasonable mm -hmm. to be ready there. Correct. So ideally there are support mechanisms mm -hmm. that we put there to help out our clients mm -hmm. as they transact. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go into a bit more in-depth sector-specific taxes, we can take a pause here and answer some questions we have from the audience, if any. Yes, um, we, I actually have a question coming in, mm -hmm. in regards to um, excise duty. Mm -hmm. um, one of our listeners um, says, okay, of course you mentioned that uh, when you go into manufacturing, but then, as you know, like you said, URIA is now going into technology, which is very good. We also have so many of these fintech companies coming up. So for the fintechs, the companies or these um, companies that are into um, technology and are creating solutions, right, mm. using technology, does excise duty apply to them since they are not manufacturing? What kind of taxes apply to the fintechs? Because we, we actually, as the deal flow facility, mm -hmm. we notice that we work with so many of them because it's now the new trend. Mm -hmm. So what kind of taxes are specific to fintech companies? Mm, so thank you very much. When we are looking at fintech, automatically we are leveraging on data. That's the way to go now. But one, as uh, before even I, I come to the taxes, once say you have a software that you're trying to come up with, what would advise you as you register for maybe taxes here, get a tin, we want you to register that uh, collateral with your Uganda Registration Services Bureau. Yeah. Because ideally it has to be, I mean we have to educate you, it, it will be your patent moving forward. Yeah. So nobody will come up with something similar to that, yeah. so that you can own it at the end of the day. Yeah. And once you own it, then that means that we are beginning to see how we can help you mm -hmm. make more money. So you have started with the technology here. Yeah. But at times you will need some software here and there. Mm -hmm. So when we are looking at technology as, um, as in URA, we basically look at technology that has come in, say, 
when I'm looking at maybe financial services, mm. um, the banks, because at times they need that. We have different sectors that at times get exemptions on the technology that comes in. Okay. So it's not a blanket thing, mm. but it depends on what the technology has come to do. Mm. Are we improving on, so let me give you an example, you could be improving on the agriculture, maybe the way they are breeding this and that. And ideally the concept is good, mm. so it depends on what technology that is. Mm. But if it's just, uh, you know, come here, get an app, you need to pay from here. I mean, that's a given. It's, it, it's business. Yeah. But there's nothing you're fathering. Yes, you're making it easier. Mm. But I'm looking at somebody who is even fathering a sector yeah. from one level to the other. So we look at what technology is coming in and what is it addressing. Then I go back to my act and see what does it specify for such a technology. Because we have those that normally do business process outsourcing, mm. then definitely we look at them in a particular way, seeing maybe where VAT comes in and where it doesn't come in. Mm. So uh, technology or uh, fintech is not a blanket thing. Mm. We look at what that particular year has for uh, software developers, mm. for this and that, then we interpret it for that. But ideally for income taxes are given mm. there is no exemption that is basically there for that the exemptions normally come in in things like vat to see that this um, software is probably affordable yeah. to those it's tailored to mm. so that we it can be affordable and not expensive that is why exemptions normally come in mm. but uh, i can't tell you it's a blanket it's thing a blanket. we address it depending on what uh, software you have so so with. at what point will a company know that they are exempted? Is it at the URSB stage or mm -hmm. at, at the your, stage when they are? At URA. At URA. Because URA, URA, is okay. basi URSB is basically telling you register mm -hmm. here, this is an uh, intellectual property, mm -hmm. we want to help you secure it yeah. and all that so that nobody comes up with such an innovation yeah. in probably seemingly what you have brought up. Mm -hmm. So it's basically encouraging the young blood, the youth, to mm -hmm. come up with, uh, to think, to think yeah. of solutions. Mm -hmm. Because now we are basically looking at a solution-based world. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. we know we have many problems, and what are the solutions? But at the URA stage, when you come probably to register, mm -hmm. we are giving you a team, then we clearly know what you are going to do, what does this, what is the software are going to do, and that's when we take uh, the law of that particular year. Yeah. Because you know, law keeps on changing, it's not static. Mm -hmm. What I read now, is not maybe what I'm going to read effective first new life. Yeah. Whenever we read the budget, there are things that come change. in and to change. Mm. So ideally it depends on when you come is how we address it. Mm, yeah. yes. Okay, then another question coming in. Uh, we have um, someone who owns a cleaning company mm. and they also manufacture bri briquettes and distribute mm. solar products. So their question is, what type of, are there any exemptions in the clean energy sector? Uh, in the clean energy, energy sector, they say they manufacture briquettes. Yeah, and distribute solar. Uh, for solar, there's an exemption, I remember, for VAT, okay. for solar base. But for clean energy, the briquettes, mm. I don't remember of any exemption okay. when it comes here to the law. All right. yeah. Okay, and um, the, other, the other question, um, coming in is from um, an exporter. There's mm. a company that is exporting fresh produce. So I guess maybe they, they want to know some of the taxes that are considered. So maybe in your response, you can basically blanket other companies that are into export business. Mm. So mm. what happens with uh, an exporter? Mm. Ideally, it's like anybody who could sell yeah. their items. But what qualifies you to be an exporter mm. is you have gotten the market outside the jurisdiction of Uganda. Yeah. That implies that what you are going to do is to export or sell your products at that destination. Mm. So when I'm looking at any exporter irrespective of the item, mm. uh, all exports are zero rated. They do not attract VAT. Mm. That is the first thing. Okay. So when I look at produce, ideally, produce is uh, fresh produce. I should imagine these are beans, 
these are ginats as probably you get them and dry them and pack something like that ideally you you are selling but out of uganda mm. implying that you have income okay i should imagine this exporter is already registered mm -hmm. for taxes mm -hmm. so this exporter has a tin mm. so this exporter is going to invoice to venue x in switzerland, switzerland. Mm -hmm. And with my system, as I told you, I leverage on that on, on technology now. Mm. I have an invoicing platform called the IFRIS. Yes. What we did, we try to ensure that whatever is in the VAT law mm. happens on the IFRIS platform. Mm. So once you tell me that this buyer is not resident in Uganda, mm. ideally that's an export. Mm. So the system is not going to capture 18%. On that transaction because I ideally told you an export is zero rated mm. so it's going to invoice less by 18 percent I am waiting for you to sell at those different destinations so when you come home here that implies that you have income so I expect my income tax mm. to be paid and I expect you to file for income tax mm. But your expenses that you incurred in getting this income are termed as allowable expenses. I allow you to deduct them before I come to the chargeable income. And I should imagine this same exporter has people who work for him or her. Yeah. These are staff mm -hmm. that are paid a salary. Mm -hmm. So I should imagine this salary has to suffer pay as you pay earn. As you earn. Yeah. So I expect this exporter on their tin to have a second tax type that is called pay as you pay earn. As you earn. Yeah. Two. I should demand this exporter in the event that we designated you mm. for withholding tax, then you equally have to have the withholding the tax. Mm. So ideally for starters, that is where I expect you to Mm. But if you're exporting, you're partly exporting and partly selling to the local market, mm. I may find myself giving you VAT here. Mm. Because ideally your turnover may be above 150 million, mm. where you qualify for VAT. Because you may be selling fresh produce, and along the fresh produce, there are other items that attract VAT. Yeah. That is there. Mm -hmm. So that is when my VAT mate come in mm. because here you're exporting fresh produce. Yeah. But ideally on the local market you may be selling even other items mm. that are vertible. So as I said, we look at you critical and critical, see yes. what other thing is mm. happening in mm. your line of produce or your line of sale or whatever it is. Mm. Then we see what needs to come in handy. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I'm uh, sorry, we have two more questions coming in. Um, uh, so, there's a company that's registered in Uganda, but they are currently looking to, to go and scale into Kenya and Zambia. Uh, so, their question is, will, will double taxation apply, or does Uganda have double taxation with these two countries? Ideally, that's what I was going to tell you. Yes. When you are trying to spread your wings, mm. this comes into tax planning. When you're trying to spread your wings, in most cases, the planners in this company, mm. the financial analysts, normally, want, normally look out for, for companies where, say, Uganda has or signed a double taxation mm. agreement. And secondly, they look out for a country that has lower rates in particular tax mm. types. Mm. So that also applies. Eh? But here it depends where you are going to investing if we have double taxation agreements yeah. then that is a fair deal yeah. we, we we can see how best to handle it as per the agreement but in the event that you invest where there is no tax, double taxation agreement mm. then definitely we have to read the law and see what exactly we need to do for you but normally people who normally companies that do this they are very smart they, they, they work it out very well yeah. and see that they are favored mm. by, by, by the taxation 
model of that com that country they are going to invest in. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, one more question um, from a company that's in the tourism sector. Yes. So their question is is around tax exemption, around um, importing, right, assets that will be supporting them in the tourism sector, like vehicles. So his question is, how can URA support them, considering that uh, Uganda is currently um, basically looking at increasing their tourism base and income that comes out of the tourism sector. So how best, how is URA positioning themselves to support these companies in line with the country's agenda? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, the tourism industry is one of the industries where as a country we expect a lot eh? yeah. just because COVID took us some steps backwards mm -hmm. eh? but that is one of the sectors that we are looking at rich in, uh, in, in income so we have a number of exemptions in the tourism sector it starts by one when you're registering for taxes mm. you have to be very clear that you are in the tourism industry yeah, then two, you are importing a vehicle. The vehicle should be a tourist vehicle. vehicle. I don't know whether, I don't have an image now, but there are vehicles that are normally, they have open roof. They, 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 <laughs> there is a way, they are fancy, fancy. Yeah. You see that basically they are tourist, tourist vehicles. Yeah. And before we even, yes, I may be seeing it with my eyes, mm. but before I even confirm, we send you to the line ministry to actually confirm mm. that what mm. I am seeing is exactly a tourist vehicle. vehicle. Mm. Once they confirm, that means you will enjoy the exemption mm. because at times there is no, uh, uh, there is no import duty mm. to make it affordable yeah. to the industry. Mm. Then two, the tourist industry within the country, mm. uh, there is a time when uh, we, we, it was clear in the law that was VAT, that when uh, you have a tourist lodge that is up country, and our up country is very clear. Yeah. It is uh, more than 50 kilometers radius mm. from what I call Kampala. Yeah. Kampala is not the city square. Mm. Let me give you an example. In tax terms, mm. when I'm on Ginger Road, after Njeru, mm -hmm. is where Kampala stops. Oh really? Yes. Okay. One would Mokono think it is stops. Kampala. I would think it stops somewhere before Seta. No, 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 no. Okay. I said in tax terms. Tax terms. Mm. So when you get there. to Njeru, yes, that is up ah, country. Ah, that's up country. Exactly. Okay. When you're in Entebbe, mm. it is not up country. It's Kampala. It's Kampala. Oh wow. So when from my <laughs> Kampala, yes. whatever it is, fifty kilometers radius. Mm. So I know about up north. Up north, uh, I'm looking at which road? Uh, the Luero Gulu Highway. Luero Gulu High Road. Mm. I think I will start from. Um, where is this place? I've forgotten the name. Mm -hmm. Not Matuga. <laughs> <laughs> Matuga is still in Kampala. Hey, Matu I oh, like, oh, Matuga is still Kampala. It's still Kampala. Um, so, not, you no. know the reason why we want it mm. that way? Yes. The reason why we want it that way mm. is we want you to develop the rural setup. Okay. And in, in developing the rural setup, ideal infrastructure has to come through with oh, it. Okay. We have to see the roads come through. Mm. And uh, maybe you will need workforce. Mm. So ideally you're creating employment opportunities to people who are there. Okay. And secondly, we want the tourists to appreciate our culture. Yeah. Because the culture is best demonstrated in such setups yeah. than in Kampala. Mm. To keep coming. So those are some of the issues where we look at our Kampala. Mm. So once that is done, mm. then uh, that is when some exemptions mm -hmm. come through. Okay. Uh, however, also in COVID, we had, um, we had something for the tourist industries where uh, even in Kampala, we were giving them uh, some exemptions mm. just to make the industry live because it has gone mm -hmm. down. Mm -hmm. But that one was specifically for a particular year. Mm. The COVID year was 2020, 2021, around there. Yeah. Then it ended. But still for the tourism industry and mm. hotel, 
we have uh, those that can bring in um, hotel equipment. It's like I bring in towels that I, I engraved, mm. so and so hotel. I bring in forks, I bring in spoons that are basically tailored to the hotel. Mm. Then uh, we have some exemptions over that okay. when you're bringing them in at clearance. So we have tried in the tourist industry to see that we can enrich it mm. because um, these are huge investments that are done, mm. and uh, it's not like it's not like a retail shop where you expect me to come in for a kilo of sugar or salt mm. Mm. maybe after two days. These are investments that one can push up. And I mean, you need to wait for some time when people are coming in. There are seasons of when tourists come in. Yeah. So ideally, it needs somebody who is a little patient, who can put in money and ideally wait. So we have tried to do some, some of these eh, mm. in that industry to see how best we can promote it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I think uh, we have one more question before I hand it back to Nora. This is an appreciation to URIA for the great work that you're doing. Uh, they're asking about, I think it's something you had answered earlier, about where they can get all the information because it seems they're all looking for tax exemptions. <laughs> so they want to know where they can come for this information, if there are any addendums, you mm. know, and any changes in the tax act, where <coughs> would they ad ideally go to? Uh, thank you very much. One, let me first think that person for appreciating. Yeah. You know appreciating URA is not something that comes <laughs> common. <laughs> Whenever they see the tax man, everybody has to change their face, their mood. That's Even true. though it's an advisory <laughs> visit where you come and say, hello, how are you? Yeah. Are things okay? Mm. Do you need any assistance? Okay. Yes. Because that is the way to go and that's what we are doing. Mm. And by the way, our clients are even surprised. Mm. They say, eh, you are an energy and a tapu banja. Uh, we don't want to be known for that. Eh? Yes. We want to be known with another face eh? mm. moving forward. So I would like to appreciate whoever has pushed in this particular compliment. Mm. And maybe the other thing, we have uh, a portal that is fully fledged. Mm. One, we have a portal on uh, www.ura.go.ug. Once you get to the portal page, we have uh, on your right hand side somewhere there in the middle, where you can look for A to Z topics. Mm. Under A to Z, we have a lot of literature there. Mm. We even have the Tax Amendment Handbook okay. on the portal, where you can look at it, because we normally put them there for, uh, for durations. It's like saying now the one we are running is 2021, 2022. Mm. It has all the amendments that are in there for income tax, for mm. VAT, for local excise duty, for customs, so everything is basically there, mm. so you can read and see what decision to make mm. in case you need either to import or otherwise. But we keep putting on, uh, we keep updating the portal page. But what happens even after July, please read the portal, because definitely we'll update it with fresh mm. amendments, fresh amendments the yeah. policy amendments that will have come through. Mm. May it have maybe a slight difference in your sector, please just keep on visiting our portal mm. because it's rich with information. Whatever I'm saying here is, is based on law. Whatever I've been saying in income tax and VAT excise duty, ideally I, I look at this law mm. and try to simplify it to that person listening to me to see that at least I can add some value yeah. onto what they are doing mm. moving forward. And maybe what I would like to tell you as you are a we have, as I told you, we are leveraging on technology. Mm. We've gone very far, we even have a WhatsApp number. Oh. We are moving with the trends. <laughs> Initially, we had, we, had, we had the toll free, mm. yeah. where you would go and call, you complain. You know, whenever I call it, it's busy. But ideally, something that is free has to be busy. Mm. Everybody would like to use that option. And that toll free is on 0800 11 7000. However, we came up with the WhatsApp number because we are looking at generations there. Mm. Our clients, the ones where we, we expect taxes, are now on WhatsApp. Mm. So even the tax education, some of it we do, we mm. do it on the different WhatsApp groups. Yeah. So what we need, what, maybe what we need to tell our clients, we are on WhatsApp, 0772 14 mm. Codro 0. Codro 0 implies that there are four zeros yeah. after 14. Okay. So that's our WhatsApp number. So at least if you're to... Um, if you were to send us a message, it's well, send us a message, we will respond to you and uh, 
you will be good at that point. But we still remain on Facebook and Twitter for those who are good in those areas. Please feel free to communicate to us as in URA so that we can make certain things clear for you moving forward. Okay. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I think um, in the interest of time, we'll take two questions. Okay. Two or one? One last one. And one last question from yes. Nora. Yes. And then we will, we will conclude the session. Correct. Good. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, thank you, Hafsa. Actually, a lot of what I wanted to discuss next has been asked in the form of questions, which was specifically around the export, mm -hmm. um, taxes around export. But I think as a parting shot, now that DRC is part of the East Africa community, now it's, mm -hmm. the, the block has grown, what opportunities do you see for Ugandan businesses in the region? Yeah, yeah. Definitely, I wouldn't like to commit myself, but with DRC, we know there is timber, <laughs> you know there is gold, <laughs> but definitely we need laws that and have to streamline yeah. Yeah. True. because we have the Mining Act here mm. with us. Mm. We need to streamline it to be very clear in the event that you're going to mine in, in Congo, mm. what, what do you need to have and mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. So it's the law. Yes, they have opened their space for us, but we are governed by the law. We have yeah. the Mining Act. We, I think an amendment will come through as we are reading the budget mm. to know how well our, 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 our citizens in Uganda will transact with them. We have timber. We, we need to be very clear and guided by law how everything will be done. But definitely we leverage on the products yeah. they have yeah. because that is where business is. <coughs> it's like saying in Uganda you will leverage on the coffee. Then we also leverage on the products mm. we have. But it's law that will guide us there so that when you found there, it is not trespassing or otherwise, mm. because now we are under one East African yeah. Community Customs Management yeah. Act. So those amendments have to come through the East African Community Customs Management Act of 2014 mm -hmm. to clearly advise the traders of how best to do it. Yeah. But otherwise, we welcome them on board. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. So thank you. Um, mm. Thank you for this session. Um, I add my voice to Williams who appreciated what URA is doing. We thank you for, this, uh, for these tax education sessions because they go a long way in streamlining the way businesses conduct or do the carry out their, their operations in a very compliant way. Um, like Nora mentioned earlier, the deal flow facility um, is here to basically also grow the ecosystem and to make sure that companies that are operating in Uganda, the small and medium enterprises, are investment ready. And we do offer lots of business development support. Uh, we carry out lots of trainings and uh, webinars, basically to be able to disseminate information that most of these companies may not be privy to. So thank you so much, Hafsa. We thank you for your time. Okay. And uh, for, for, for those who are uh, listening in, uh, like she mentioned earlier, uh, URA is now digital. You can get all the information you want on their website. They have a, whats a WhatsApp number that has also been posted. And uh, for any query, please feel free to reach out to them. Thank you so much, Hafsa. And maybe the other thing I would like and probably should tell our listeners to be mm -hmm. our viewers, that normally uh, these sessions, we upload them on YouTube. Yeah. Feel free to visit the YouTube and you will get the sessions of what you missed. You might have joined us a little later yeah. than uh, when we started. Feel free to visit YouTube and uh, definitely you'll see us there as in your ATV. Yes. And to much. reach out to the deal flow facility, you can send us an email at dff at fsduganda.or.ug and we'll be happy to interact with you and give you more information on how you can participate in the deal flow facility. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Acquiring a tin is now easier than ever before with a new interface that is brief, simple and cuts out all the excess fields from previous applications. All you need is your national ID or driver's license or passports and internet access and you're good to go. No more waiting in long queues as you can now acquire a tin instantly from wherever you are. Remember, it's free! Experience our new and improved modern interface that is user-friendly. Thank you for paying your taxes. Uganda Revenue Authority.
Developing Uganda Together.